So, we begin the second week of the MLSS in exactly the same way we ended, or where we ended the first week of the Machine Learning Summer School, with thinking about the connection between computation and inference and learning. So on Saturday, I try to convince you that there is a quite deep connection, not just a philosophical, but actually a quite st strict mathematical connection between inference on the one hand and computation on the other. This mathematical connection is, is precise in the sense that there are certain important, very basic numerical algorithms, and I had examples from integration and the solution of differential equations, which have exact partners in classic statistical models, such that inference, map inference in the classic statistical model is equivalent, produces the same numbers, has the same cost as the classic numerical method. I also spoke about two kind of ideas for applications of this insight. One of them was that if you know that your method makes a particular implicit prior assumption, computation you're performing implies some prior assumptions, you can try and encode more prior information that you might have available about your problem to improve computational performance. Another idea is that if you have a sequence of numerical methods, a sequence of, sequence of black boxes that have to hand on their results to each other, then you can try and tag onto those results a measure of uncertainty, a probability measure, and then use this to reason about where the errors in your composite system arise. Today, I'll talk about two more areas of computation, perhaps the most basic area, linear algebra, and optimization, although quite a different kind of optimization than the one that Steve Boyd talked about. Um, and I'll use these two areas, to, well, just to talk about these two areas, but also to uh, highlight sort of two more aspects. The first half, the one on linear algebra, will be a little bit drier, more theoretical. There, I'd like to uh, think a little bit about w why, like, what, what kind of challenges arise in computation that um, are perhaps a little bit different to the kind of problems we usually deal with in uh, machine learning, so it's sort of computational issues. Um, and then in optimization, I'll talk more about kind of applications and where we can expect these kind of ideas to, to help. Okay, so I'll start with linear algebra. Um, of course, linear algebra is a really large field, actually, and uh, you all learned um, a lot about it probably in the very first year of your undergraduate course. I will focus on one particular kind of problem, because otherwise I could spend several of these lectures just talking about linear algebra. I'll talk about the problem of finding a vector x of length n, such that um, a matrix A times x equals this vector B, which is of the same size as the vector x. Therefore, the matrix A has to be quadratic of size n by n. And to make things simple, I'll assume that A is symmetric positive definite. One reason I make this assumption is that if this is true, then there is a unique inverse to A, and we can just talk about this inverse without constantly having to talk about whether it exists or not. The other reason why this is an interesting problem is that this is this then forms one of the most basic machine learning tasks uh, there are, and that's least squares regression, or kernel rich regression, or Gaussian process regression, or linear SVMs, or whatever the name is you have learned for this particular method. So uh, as Neil Lawrence uh, has been talking about this a lot, I don't need to spend much time on this, but you now all know that to compute the posterior mean of a Gaussian process regressor or a kernel rich regressor, you have to form this very large matrix, sorry, this matrix, which is of the size, number of data points per number of data points. It's positive definite. Then you have to invert this matrix and multiply it with the data set, which you could call B, if you like. And then, basically, that means you have to find exactly this vector X, which solves this task that I just posed. And so you've all learned in your elementary numerics course or computer science course or wherever that inverting a matrix is cubically expensive in the number of element of le uh, the length of this matrix, right? It's n cubed. One interesting aspect about this problem is, of course, that in machine learning, we don't just invert any matrix. We invert these matrices. So these are matrices that have a history, right? They are, there's a story to them. They are created by taking a data set, evaluating a kernel function on this data set. So they have all sorts of interesting structure that might be helpful in, to improve this kind of computation, even though I won't actually talk about this today. OK, so let's say we didn't know anything about numerical linear algebra. So it's 1803, 
And we don't know how to invert matrices, but we know that they are matrices and we know that they have lots of interesting properties. And we would like to come up with an inversion algorithm for matrices that uses probability distributions, a Bayesian matrix inversion algorithm, if you like. How would we do that? We do it exactly the same way that we built a Bayesian integration method or a Bayesian solver for differential equations or a Bayesian model for uh, the height distribution of the population. You start with a generative model. You write down a probability distribution over a joint probability distribution over the things you can get to see, the numbers you can compute, and the numbers you don't know, which is the inverse of this matrix. So here is one ugly math-heavy slide. I apologize in advance. There will be about three or four of these really ugly slides. And after that, things will get smoother again. So this is the object we would like to know, the inverse of the matrix A. Um, and because this object will be so important, I'll give it a name. I'll call it H. This has historical reasons. In the optimization community, such matrices tend to be called H. So this is the thing we'd like to know. And what, what is this? So that's just n square numbers. It's n square real uh, floating point numbers. So we could take these n square numbers and just put them in one long list, not as a matrix, not as a square, but we just write them as one long list, as a vector. Right? And then it's obvious how to be uncertain about them. You just assign a Gaussian uncertainty to these n square numbers. It's not a Gaussian process. It's just a parametric Gaussian distribution over n square numbers. That's this distribution. Um, so just to write out what I mean by that, I will use this little notation just for about one or two slides. Uh, this means that I've taken this matrix A and I've reshaped it into a vector. So in MATLAB, you do that by writing H brackets colon, right? That's what I mean. It's a really, really simple operation. Um, this is a Gaussian distribution, so it'll need a mean and a covariance. The mean will be any matrix that we also reshape into a vector. For example, this could be the unit matrix or a scalar matrix or any other matrix that you like. And we need a covariance matrix, which only has to be positive definite. That's all it has to be, or maybe semi-definite. Um, what, what is the size of this matrix sigma? That's perhaps the only interesting object, uh, an interesting sort of thing. Um, this matrix describes how we think numbers in one location in the matrix, at location ij, co-vary with another element of the matrix at location kl. So this matrix has to be, has to be of size n squared by n squared. It's a very, very large matrix. Okay, using this, we can just write down this distribution. It's easy. Um, and then we can think about the things that we can compute. The things we can compute extremely efficiently on computers like this, this is perhaps the most efficient operation that these computers can do, is we can multiply this matrix A with another matrix with a vector or with a matrix S. So just, just whoop. There's some picture. So this is the matrix A. And we can multiply this with some sort of long and skinny matrix of size n by m, where this is n by n. If we do that, then we get back a vector y, which is of the same size as s. And you could now call, you can call this sort of an, an action you choose, right? a choice you make to multiply this matrix with this, and this a data point that you receive, essentially. So because A is invertible, we can also write this equation as um, S equals H times Y, simply just multiplying with H from the left. And um, what we now have clearly is a linear observation of H. So there is this long uh, vector of elements in H. It has elements IJ. And what we're doing here is we're summing over some of these elements and we get back S. So this summation, so usually we write it like this, but you could also sort of write this with this V-shaped vector of, of uh, elements of the matrix H with some complicated linear operator called C. Doesn't really matter what the structure of this thing is. It turns out to be a Kronecker product, and you've heard about Kronecker products from Neil Lawrence on Saturday. Um, but the important thing is it's just, it's just a linear projection. Gaussians are closed under linear projections, so that's wonderful if you have a Gaussian prior over the elements of the matrix, and we make this linear observation of the elements of the matrix, we can condition on them, and out comes a Gaussian posterior, which has this form. And this, you can just look up in a textbook. There's nothing fancy about that. So I've really just written down this generic form of a Gaussian posterior, given a linear observation of, a linear projection of the latent variable. 
this is what this object looks like. And so this, would, this will be sort of our generic framework for building, this, this is the basis, the model on which we're going to build a solver or an inversion algorithm for, ma for matrices. So far though, it's not a particularly good one yet because it requires us to multiply this big covariance matrix sigma of size n square by n square with this generic linear projection uh, um, operator. And doing this, just computing this matrix, so this matrix here is going to be of size nm by nm because there are nm numbers in Y, that's how many data points we've collected basically. And computing this matrix generically will cost n cubed times m. So that's not a good approach, right? This is, this is too expensive. Just to, just to even compute the object we need to think about how we, what the inverse of the matrix is, we, even have to, we already have to spend more operations than, than to use a classic algorithm and invert the matrix. Okay, so we'll have to do something about that. Actually, there's another problem we also have to address. And that is that we don't know yet what sigma should be. It's a bit silly to just say, I'm just going to write down some covariance matrix, and that's going to work wonderfully. So um, we will have to both make sure sigma somehow encodes a meaningful prior uncertainty over the elements of the matrix, and to make sure that it's possible to, make this, to perform this computation efficiently on a computer at low computational cost. It'll turn out that these two problems are integrally linked, and you can actually solve them both at the same time by making very convenient choices. So there'll be three sort of steps to this, to this result. There's always three, of course, either three or five, uh, to get to this kind of result. The first one is we'll have to make some assumption about the structure of sigma to make it easier to, make, to compute this object here. And that assumption will turn out to be that, um, is, is turn out to be a factorization assumption. So we'll assume that the covariance between element ij and the element kl of the matrix H consists of two terms, one that mediates correlation between rows. This will be called a matrix WJL. And one object which mediates uh, the, the covariance between columns, and this will be called VIK. This is another way of uh, saying that the covariance has Kronecker structure. And you've seen Kronecker matrices before in Neil's talk, so I'm not going to talk more about them anymore. It also doesn't really matter. It's just a particular assumption, a particular structure of a matrix that makes computations easier. The important thing about this is this assumption does not mean that we are restricting the prior class to certain matrices. This matrix is still positive definite. It has rank n squared. So with this choice, we can still learn any matrix. So what Zubin said on Tuesday about the uh, consistency of Bayesian point estimates holds in this case. We have a prior that puts mass on the entire hypothesis class. So if you have sufficient data, we will learn the correct answer, no matter what the correct answer is, as long as it lies in this space. Um, one interesting way to think about this is that what this does is it puts a, an arrow bar on the elements of the matrix IJ, so a marginal variance, which, has, uh, which consists of the sort of outer product of the diagonal elements of these two matrices V and W. That will become interesting in a moment. You can already think about the fact that this means we have n squared numbers in HIJ, but this assumption allows us only n or two n numbers to construct these error bars. So there'll be a restriction of what kind of uncertainty we can represent with this space. If you do this, if you choose this particular covariance, then the posterior simplifies a lot. The posterior distribution now is a Gaussian, and it its posterior mean, and we'll for the moment mostly care about this mean, consists of this H0, which is a matrix we get to choose. So for example, we could choose it to be a scalar matrix or a diagonal matrix or something simple, plus this S minus H0Y, so this is a, ma a matrix of this size, it's a long and skinny matrix, times a small M by M matrix, which, is, which contains Y transpose times W times Y, and then this object here, which is a fat and broad matrix. So this is already kind of a good object because this is easy to represent. It has a low complexity of to be represented on a computer. It's basically an outer product, okay? 
Um, and this is what these kind of posteriors look like. So this is the first time I'm actually showing you some of these samples. So here is an actual inverse. This is now a smaller matrix than the one I had on my slide number one, because otherwise you wouldn't see anything. So this is a 30 by 30 matrix. And uh, I actually got this by taking 30 ran uh, uniformly random uh, locations x in a three-dimensional space, computing a kernel gram matrix over it, and inverting it. So that's kind of the object we would need for a 30 data point Gaussian process regressor. Right? Uh, of course, in reality, you usually have you don't have 30. You have a million of these points. but a million points are difficult to represent on a projector, so let's think about a 30 by 30 matrix. This is the posterior distribution over the elements of this matrix we get after taking our matrix A, which looks like this, this is the inverse of this, and multiplying it with a completely randomly chosen vector S, so the numbers in here are just uniform Gaussian, uh, not uniform, standard Gaussian random numbers, multiplying A with S gives Y. Conditioning on this observation gives us this posterior distribution. So now we are, uh, and, and if you condition, by the way, on 29 such numbers, which are, again, standard Gaussian drawn, so they are approximately linearly independent, then this actually, this actually converges. Well, 29 are not enough yet, because there are 30, it's a 30 by 30 matrix. But after 29, you're basically converged. So you can see a little bit of wobbling going on in here, a little bit of sampling, but we're almost, we've almost figured out what the true inverse is. So, um, what are the problems left? So the one problem is I haven't sh told you how to choose S. I just chose them at random. That seems to be a little bit too easy. And I still haven't figured out what W is going to be, this prior uncertainty. I also still have this problem that there is a matrix inverse in my matrix inversion algorithm. That's a bit silly. That seems a bit recursive, right? So this matrix is somehow easier because it's M by M. It's a lot smaller than the matrix I, initially, I actually need to invert. But I still need to invert it. And that's sort of annoying, right? So I'd like to get rid of this matrix inverse. So I'd like to turn, ideally, I'd like to turn this matrix into a diagonal matrix, because then I know how to do the inverse with floating point operations. Um, to do that, I would have to choose y's such that they, these y's are what's called conjugate to w. Whatever w is, I have to be able to choose y's such that this matrix is diagonal. That's difficult, because these y's are something I get back from the matrix A. I don't really get to choose them. I can choose s. But the y's are data points that are sort of handed to me. So again, two problems. There they are again. Well, we'd like to make this matrix diagonal, and we'd like to choose w such that this prior uncertainty actually means something. It's not just some Gaussian that I've drawn out of a hat, but something that actually means something. So we'll solve both of them at the same time, actually, by thinking about how we should choose w such that it gives a well-scaled prior. And for that, I'll essentially go back to the previous slide where I said that if you choose um, the prior covariance to be a Kronecker product between V and W, then the error bars on the elements of the matrix H, the marginal variances, are these numbers, VII times WJJ. So what would be the optimal choice for these two matrices to give good calibrated error bars on this matrix? It would be, and I already have it on the slide, so I can't ask you, otherwise you just say, well, it's whatever is on your slide. So an interesting observation is that because H is positive definite, you can sort of open up a textbook about positive definite matrices, and one thing you'll find in there is that positive definite matrices are, in quotation marks, diagonally dominant in the following sense, that the square of any element anywhere in the matrix, or anywhere in here, is smaller or equal to the product of the corresponding diagonal elements. So the absolute value of this number is smaller than the, than the product of this, uh, this number squared is smaller than this number times this number. So what we could do is we could choose, let's say our uh, prior mean is something very small. It's basically the zero matrix, just, just a little bit away from zero so that it's still invertible. And so it's at the sort of tip of the positive definite cone. Then if we could somehow choose V equal to W equal to H, the actual matrix we're trying to invert, then we would have error bars on this diagonal which are perfect in the sense that they are, are exactly the number that we're looking for. So this would be this matrix here, and on its diagonal you'll find the exact same numbers you find on the diagonal of this matrix. And on the off-diagonal terms, we'll have um, conservative error bars in the sense that they are always larger or equal than the absolute value of this number in here. Of course, we can't really do that because we don't know what H is, right? That's the thing we're looking for. So what I've just done is I've essentially sort of made an argument for how 
the, the, what the optimal choice for the prior uncertainty should be, and not actually like how you choose that because it involves the matrix you don't have yet. So this is something to, sh to shoot for, something we will, we will try to achieve, not something we can just actually do because it involves a matrix you don't have yet. However, if you now look at this posterior distribution again, and for a moment allow me to just talk about the posterior mean, and I'll get back to you about the posterior covariance in a moment, then you'll notice that if you look at this object and look at where W shows up, you see that W always only shows up in a product with Y. There's no lonely W in here. So if I implicitly choose W to be H, I can replace Y times H with what I already know Y times H to be, it's S. So I can just, wherever I had a W times Y before, I just write S. Because this just follows from this equation. So what this essentially is, is some kind of, some kind of empirical Bayesian way of calibrating your uncertainty at runtime. If you do that, then you get implicitly this kind of prior distribution. So this is uh, draws from a Gaussian distribution with zero mean, which has this matrix as its covariance in a conical product. This is somehow a better scaled distribution. Um, we, we're not talking yet about this W in here, because this is obviously a lot harder, because there is a lonely W in here. I'll get back to that in about three slides. But now we have a, a very nicely calibrated distribution, a uh, posterior estimate up here for just the mean. So if I only wanted a point estimate, this would be a very interesting object. And I can obviously compute it without ever having to talk about W again. There's another wonderful property, and with that we're basically done, of this matrix here. And that's that I can also write this matrix as, um, so Y transpose times S can also be written as S transpose times A times S, because that's what Y is, right? It's A times S. And that, is a matrix that only contains things that I have control over, S. And I can choose these projection directions such that they are conjugate under A. There's a way to do that that is called the Gram-Schmidt process. Hands up, who has heard of the Gram-Schmidt process before? Almost everyone. Who has implemented it before? Yourself? Okay, about half of you. So for most of you, you will have learned about Gram-Schmidt in uh, sort of linear algebra 101 and it's a method for, con for constructing an orthogonal set of vectors. It can actually also be used in a really tiny minor variation to construct a set of conjugate directions. You just replace, uh, where well you used to have sort of an S in here in your Gram-Schmidt, you replace it with the projection of this, of this uh, vector. And so now this process works, just to remind you in the following sense, the following way, you start with a set of vectors, which you have sort of mentally chosen somewhere, and you start with the first vector, you do your projection with that, you work with that, then you say take the second vector and you adapt it such that it becomes conjugate to the previous vector by subtracting this kind of projection from, so U is the set of vectors that we are working with and we are correcting them, each of them in sequence, iteratively by terms like that. If I choose these set of vectors to be orthogonal vectors, initially, so to be a basis of the vector space, then actually I can even drop this sum and I only need the preceding term. So then this computation becomes very cheap. It's O of N in each step. And if I do that, then I'll end up with a, so I, I get to choose my S with this, with this process. So I choose them by starting with an orthogonal set of vectors. Then I start, take the first of these orthogonal vectors, multiply it with the matrix A, out comes a vector Y, I take the second orthogonal vector, use Gram-Schmidt to make it conjugate to the previous direction, then multiply it with the matrix A, out comes a vector Y, I stack them together into this kind of matrix, and at any point during this process, I can now write a posterior distribution, sorry, a posterior mean, or under this Gaussian prior, which has this form. So it's basically this expression where this matrix is now diagonal, so I can explicitly write this as a sum with just simple floating point divisions. So this will now look like this expression where this is a diagonal matrix. Right, so now there's no more matrix inversion going on. And I've built basically a point estimate for matrix inversion. The only thing I haven't told you yet how to do is how to choose S. Well, actually, I told you how to choose S, but I sort of based it on these basic set of directions. So you have to start with a set of orthogonal vectors, and then after that, everything is automatic. So which set of orthogonal, of orthogonal vectors should we choose? 
What's your favorite set of orthogonal vectors? The yes, the unit vectors. Let's try and use the unit vectors. So we'll, we'll choose those vectors to be the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And I'll show you how this, how this algorithm works. Unfortunately, this is a relatively small plot, so let me just switch off the lights for the moment. And let's hope that you can see this a little bit better. So this is the matrix we're looking for, the true inverse. We don't know this matrix yet. Instead, what we'll do is we'll take these unit vectors, E, we'll put them through this Gram-Schmidt process to build these projections S, multiply the matrix A, which is not on this slide, with S to get out the vector Y, and this will construct a posterior distribution over A. And whether this is a good distribution or not, one way to see that is to just multiply this posterior mean estimate, HM, with A, because if this works well, then this should be a, a unit matrix, right? This should become a unit matrix at some point. So to make it easier for you to see, I'm only plotting the absolute values of, this, of the, the numbers in this matrix, because otherwise it would be difficult to see zeros in here. It's still difficult to see anything anyway. So the very first direction is a unit uh, vector. So it's just 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. You can't see anything yet. We multiply it, we get y. This is the posterior. Now we have 2. You still don't see anything because it's so tiny. So instead, I'll move to 10. So you can see something a little bit, maybe. Let's move down the slide, this, uh, the shades. So what you see here is a matrix which is upper, upper triangular. That's just a property of the Gram-Schmidt process. So we've taken our unit vectors and then iteratively, in each step, corrected for the previous directions, which means that we get a little bit of some small numbers up here, but only zeros below. This matrix Y happens to be lower triangular. Why that's the case is a little bit more tricky, so if you want to think about that after the lecture, have fun in the afternoon, try to find out why this is lower triangular, but it is. This is the posterior distribution over H. So you see there's basically no number in here we're already certain about after 10 evaluations. It's, no, it's not like we're finding individual numbers and sort of hammering them down. They're just, we're still totally uncertain, basically. But we know now a lot about the covariance. The covariance between these numbers has now changed. They've sort of been, the, their, their relative size has been fixed. Their absolute value is not clear yet. And what you can barely see up here is that something really interesting has happened to this matrix. The upper, the first 10 rows of that matrix have just become those of a unit matrix. So we have now basically figured out one row after the other how to make this matrix a unit matrix. And that's a property of the basic linear algebra alg algorithm we've just rediscovered, gauss order elimination. So this whole very complicated integral process I just went through was a probabilistic way of motivating gauss jordan elimination. So now it's not 1803 anymore, it's 1809 and we've caught up with Gauss, and we've basically just discovered how to do this algorithm, right? Okay, great, so it's 2015, and I've just spent 40, no, 30 minutes rediving an algorithm you learned in high school. Is that interesting? Well, perhaps, let me see if I can wake you up again. A little bit, a little bit more maybe. Um, so we did something else as well. So this, this, by the way, is after, oh, this is maybe interesting, after 29 evaluations, so this is almost the entire matrix, um, we have basically a unit matrix here except for the final row, and we're still uncertain about every element of this matrix. So it's not like we've na nailed down every individual element of this matrix. We just know how they relate to each other such that you get a unit matrix, almost a, a perfect unit matrix. And after 30 evaluations, we're done. Now it's, this is a unit matrix. Okay, so Gaussian elimination is a maximum posterior estimate of H under some well-skilled Gaussian prior if the sort of probe directions are chosen to be unit directions. Um, how did we get there? We, st we sort of used the, the basic building blocks of a probabilistic numerical method a joint probability distribution over everything you know and everything you don't know. Then we had to make, and this is perhaps interesting, we had to make certain assumptions about the factorization of this prior to make computation easy. So that's not a, a, an inference requirement, it's a computation requirement. If, you're building, if you want to build fast method, you have to think about what kind of assumptions you allow yourself. Then we had to make, make the prior well scaled. That was maybe a little bit too much, thanks. <laughs> 
Um, and that actually doing that also happened to allow us to, to do some very efficient bookkeeping called Graham Schmidt, which allowed us to construct a, an estimate which, which is a low rank description, which doesn't involve any matrix inversions. And then we had to decide, so that's the second ingredient for a probabilistic numerical method, you have to actively decide what kind of information you want to collect. And we did this in a, maybe a quite naive way, we just chose to go through the unit vectors one after the other. So, so far, we only have constructed a posterior mean, a point estimate. So we really haven't done anything better than Gauss so far. So to make this more interesting, I'd like to add a meaningful uncertainty to this object, something that means something in some vague sense, and it'll actually be quite vague. Uh, this is a construction that you can also find in a paper that was published early this year in the uh, SIAM Optimization Journal. So we, um, we have to deal with this object in the back here. So this is now nice. This is uh, Gauss-Jordan, wonderful. What is, going, what is this going to be? So there, this will have to be a matrix W, which should somehow have something to do with H. Or more precisely, it should have the property that when you multiply it with Y, you get back S. Because that's the assumption we implicitly make in this part. So we need to choose a w such that w times y is s. It's quite easy to write a matrix like that. You just choose w to be s times y transpose s inverse times s transpose. Because obviously, if you multiply this with y, those two numbers cancel and you're left with s. Right? That's trivial. However, if you choose w to be this, just this term, and then in the posterior, we have to subtract this wonderful term. These happen to be the same. That means at each step of the algorithm, we are claiming to perfectly know what the inverse of the matrix A is. So there's some kind of overfitting essentially going on, right? So that's not the answer. The answer is that there's a whole space of parameters left that haven't been fixed yet, right? By saying that I want a matrix such that a long and skinny matrix times that matrix is some other long and skinny matrix, I've just fixed n times m of the numbers in that matrix, not n squared. So I'm left with n minus m times n numbers that I still have to somehow fix. This is one of these, as Neil called them, what large p, small n problems. There's more parameters in our algorithm that we have to choose than we will get to see. Well, actually, there are exactly as many parameters in there as we'll get to see during the entire run of the algorithm. And this is the most elementary computation you're doing on your computer all the, all the time, right? This is your backslash in MATLAB. This, this operation. So even the most elementary computation you're performing is already fitting pr more parameters than it has data points. So what we can do is we'll, we'll do the same we do in machine learning all the time or in statistics. We say, well, if there are more parameters than we have data points, we'll just assume that the rest of the parameters we haven't seen yet, the ones we don't know yet, they will be somehow related to each other. We'll regularize them. We'll say they will have some kind of simple structure so that we can describe them in a smaller space. For example, I could say this entire matrix W consists of a part which, if you multiply it with Y, returns S, and then another part which, if you multiply it with Y, just gives zero. So it's sort of separating these two problems into the bits that I know, the bits that I don't know. This is what this kind of filter looks like. So this is a projection operator onto the complement of Y, essentially, in this vector space. So we get to choose a matrix omega in here which you can show more or less completely freely, and it won't change this property that if you multiply the matrix with Y, you get back S. And now, this is a statistical estimation problem. Now, you get to say what your rule is to estimate omega. And you can construct all sorts of statistical arguments to do that. So far, to my knowledge, there's only exactly one argument. That's the one that's in this paper, and it's not a particularly good one, but it's at least one. And that's to say, well, what we can do is we can just look at the numbers in this diagonal matrix that are being collected as the algorithm runs. And these are scalar numbers. So after, n, after m of these steps, we have m such numbers. Here's what they look like for this particular matrix that I showed you before, this 30 by 30 matrix. And we could construct some regularized estimate of those numbers from them as they come in. That's quite cheap to do because they are scalars. So we can just run some simple, for example, a running average over them. right? What that amounts to is to say, essentially, that the remaining columns or rows, no, the remaining columns of this matrix that we haven't probed yet, probably look a little bit like the first few columns we've seen. That actually makes a lot of sense in a least squares regression case. If you assume you have a big data set, 
and this data set is somehow randomly uh, uh, ordered, so there's nothing special about the first few data points, then this um, kernel matrix, this big million by million kernel matrix, there's nothing special about its first few columns, right? It's just some data points that have been IID drawn from the data set. So you could say, if I've just looked at the first 20 of those columns, well, the remaining 1 million minus 20 will probably look quite similar to the first 20. So I could run some sort of running average over them and say, these numbers, I'll somehow transform them into something that goes into omega in a simple way. I'll just claim that omega is a scalar matrix, which is somehow related to this running average, and I'll construct an estimate from that. Here is what this kind of looks like. This is one example for, this, for our 30 by 30 matrix that I've shown you before. This is how you would ideally like to choose your posterior covariance. This is if you start, oh, it's exactly the wrong way around. I'm sorry, these, these titles are flipped. So this here is if you start with W equal to the exact H, which you can't do, but imagine you could, then this would be your post posterior covariance matrix. And if you start, if you run this estimate after uh, I think 10 steps, you get this kind of matrix out. So this is not perfect. There are some numbers in here that are larger than they are in here. There are some numbers in here that are smaller than they are in here. But some of the structure of this matrix has carried over. It's a little bit too dark again, but you can sort of see the bands coming out here as well. So in that sense, and I'm very hand wavy now, we've constructed a posterior uncertainty estimate around the inverse of a matrix constructed with Gauss-Jordan elimination. That was one of the tasks I had on my very first slide on Saturday morning. I said, if you run gauss jordan elimination and you stop it after 10 steps, what do you know about the matrix? Well, here's a way of constructing an estimate for how much you know about this inverse matrix. Okay, that is the takeaway. Um, to discover, sort of rediscover this classic 200-year-old algorithm, we had to construct a scaled, structured prior, and then choose a particularly naive exploration strategy to construct a Gaussian posterior distribution on the elements of an inverse of a matrix. And there were a lot of parameters in there that we had to estimate. And for that, uh, we constructed some regularized estimator in an empirical Bayesian fashion that returns an estimate for the uncertainty. <coughs> this is as, like half a year old, these kind of results. So there's still a lot left to do. But we're beginning to assign meaningful uncertainty to these kind of matrices. OK, so this algorithm, Gaussian elimination, is 200 years old. Is it worth thinking about this? Well, what you can do once you have a posterior distribution is you can say, well, maybe there are some tricks that we're using in machine learning that we can use to improve this process. The first thing you could do is maybe to say, oh, actually, one of the very first things you could do is, oh, actually, I've, I've assumed that A is a symmetric positive de definite matrix. So far, I haven't actually encoded yet that A is symmetric or positive definite. It's quite difficult to encode positive definiteness because the positive definite cone is not a vector space. It's restricted. But it's easy to encode symmetry, actually. You can just include the fact that the matrix is symmetric. Don't even look at all this, ma all this matrix stuff. You can look at that afterwards. This is the important bit. This is a draw from the prior that I just talked about for half an hour. This is a draw from a prior that assumes symmetry. And otherwise, it's the same prior as that. It's easy to, easy to do that, because if you take a, a matrix, take it, turn it into a long vector, and you want to encode that it's symmetric, encoding that is just a bunch of linear constraints. Right? It's just saying that certain numbers are equal in that long list. That's a linear constraint, so you can encode it in a Gaussian prior quite easily. Unfortunately, actually, this doesn't help all that much. It doesn't, for example, reduce the computational cost by a factor of two, which is maybe what you would expect, but it's not true. So it's actually not all that important. It just simplifies some of the derivations and makes things a little bit more elegant, but it doesn't actually, do, doesn't actually help much. So not much gain. We're still at 1809, trying to catch up with the numerical mathematicians. So the next thing we could do is, oh, we've chosen these search directions in a really inefficient way. We've chosen them to be uh, unit vectors. That may be not the right, right thing to do. Let's say I wanted to, to um, solve, I know that I have to solve a particular problem. I know that I'm constructing the posterior mean of a particular Gaussian process with a particular data set. I have my data set B available already. So somehow I'd like to choose projections of the matrix A such that the error on this estimate drops as quickly as possible, not just unit directions. I want the directions to be informative about this particular problem. One way to think about this is to say that this, solving this problem is equivalent to minimizing this quadratic function. So this is a real-valued function that takes vectors of length n at its input. It's a quadratic form, 
x transpose times a times x times a half minus x transpose b. Those of you who are fit with their uh, matrix analysis will notice that the gradient of this function is just a times x minus b. So if you manage to solve this equation, then you've managed to make this gradient zero. And if you manage to make this gradient zero, then you've solved this equation. So these two are, in that sense, they are equivalent. So this is interesting because this is now sort of a gradient. We can talk about this object as the gradient of what we are trying to do, of a, of an, of an, a loss function. And you can try to, make, to reduce this loss function as quickly as possible. So instead of choosing such directions which are unit vectors, we could start with this direction as the very first projection. So we start with some x0, maybe it's 0, or whatever our initial estimate wants to, wants to be. For example, it could be the uh, inverse of the, like the initial guess, so h0 times b. Uh, let's plug that in. That gives us a first gradient. This points in some direction. And we'll just optimize in this direction first. Because this is a quadratic problem, this optimization is analytic, actually. You can just compute it in a linear operation. So that removes this gradient from the problem. And we are now at a new location. And at this new location, there's a new gradient, which is orthogonal to the previous gradient. Then we can optimize away this gradient. Then we have a new gradient, which is, again, orthogonal to the previous gradient. Right? So that produces a set of orthogonal directions, which we could use instead of the unit vectors. And run Gram Schmidt on that. So that's a famous idea, actually, unfortunately. It's called the Arnoldi process, or the Langschloss process on a symmetric matrix. And if you do that, and you write down this algorithm, you write down the actual algorithm you have to do, you look at the stuff a while, sort of simplify it a little bit, clean up your code, you're left with this code, and you'll discover that you have not, not invented anything new. You've invented conjugate gradients, which was proposed by Hessler and Stiefel in 1952. So conjugate gradients is an active learning algorithm on a particular linear problem. So now we've just caught up 150 years of linear algebra from 1809 to 1952. That's great, but still not 2015. Annoying. However, that's great. It's actually a good algorithm. So here's, a, here's just to sort of, if you haven't seen conjugate gradients yet, this is how well this works. Um, here's the same picture as before, now with conjugate gradients. So the S in here is the first gradient, and you can't see it. This is it after 10 steps. The important thing is this is not an upper triangular matrix anymore, and this isn't either. It's just a dense matrix. Uh, this is not turning into a unit matrix sort of uh, in a structured way. It's just uniformly kind of converging to a unit matrix. Um, here is the kind of performance. These are these residuals, these, uh, like these R's, as they develop over the run of the algorithm. This is Gauss-Jordan, and this is conjugate gradient. So this is the algorithm that uses unit di directions, one after the other, without any order. This is the algorithm that chooses the interesting directions first. Other than that, they are the same. Uh, this is the same plot, by the way, once linear, once logarithmic, so that you can see sort of the difference. Uh, you can clearly, this red line converges very quickly initially, and sort of it does the interesting things first, while a gauss jordan is some, in some sense basically doesn't converge until the very last step, and then it converges to the same point because like, this is sort of numerical precision of this implementation. So clearly, this is, not, this is not 10 to the minus 32. That's because I've implemented it in this annoying way and not in, like, in an efficient, numerically stable way. And um, interestingly, well, so after 10 steps, actually, this is almost a unit matrix already, which it wouldn't have been in the Gauss-Jordan case. OK, so conjugate gradients is also interpretable as sort of a particular probabilistic inference scheme, but it's 60 years old, so we still haven't caught up yet. So OK, so now you go back and say, oh, there must be something that we can do with machine learning that these people haven't thought of yet. So maybe it has to be a little bit more complicated. And here's an example of a more complicated idea. This is a very complicated picture. So don't look at this picture. Listen to me for a moment. Nah. Um, this is sort of a version of something that maybe Michael will mention in his talk later in the week. It's an image deconvolution problem. So I've borrowed this problem from Bernard and Michael and his team. Um, this is not what, what we do, but it's sort of something that happens in the department uh, next door. Imagine you have a telescope looking at the stars. You're trying to take a picture of a star formation in the sky, but you're looking through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is wobbling, so you're getting distortions on your image, and you can describe these distortions as a linear operation, as a convolution. So to remove these distortions, you have to solve a linear problem. And you have to solve this linear problem for every frame of your video. Every time a frame comes in, you have to run your matrix inversion algorithm to get an estimate for the deconvolved image. The next image comes in, you have to run the deconvolution algorithm again. The next image comes in, and so on. 
So what you could do is you could just have a bank of conjugate gradient solvers, and they just run one frame after the other. And they're completely separate from each other. If you do that, then you get kind of convergence like this. There's frame comes in, conjugate gradient runs. It's done. Next frame comes in, conjugate gradient runs. Co like op optimizes away some error. Next frame comes in, and so on. These are completely separate algorithms, so there's no reason why one of them should be better than the other. And these problems are all similarly difficult, because you're sort of looking at the sky. So some of them take a little bit longer, some of them are a little bit faster, but they're basically the same. Right? So what you could do now is, ah, I've just discovered that what these algorithms do is they construct a posterior estimate over the solution of a linear problem. And of course, video frames are related to each other, one after the other. It's not like they're completely independent problems. So what this is, is an instance of a, a set of related numerical problems of the same type. And if I know that they are related to, to each other somehow, I might want to share information between them. A simple way to do that is to say, well, I run conjugate gradient on my very first image, so these two lines are the same up here. And then, once I've done that, I just plug out this posterior distribution over the matrix inverse, and I just hand it on to the next instance as a prior. So the next instance doesn't start with this uniform prior. It starts with sort of a calibrated prior. And then it does its thing, and it hands it on to the next instance. If you do that, you get a sequence of solvers that converge faster and faster until they reach some kind of limit performance. And then they end up running about twice as fast in this particular case. So that's an instance of transfer learning or multitask learning in numerics. Isn't that a cool idea? Turns out that numerical mathematicians have thought of it as well. Annoying. So in their, in their uh, field, this is called recycling Krylov sequences. It's the kind of term you don't find until you know what you're supposed to Google for. Right? That's what it's called. And it was proposed in 2006 by some guys. So we've, just, we've, we've almost caught up. Right? So we made it from 1809 to 1952 to 2006. So we're still six years behind the American mathematicians, but that's like three years of progress for us. Okay? So now I'm very confident that uh, one of the next steps will finally catch up with them and tell them something new that they couldn't do yet. Even if we, we don't end up doing that, at least now we found something we can use in machine learning that we didn't know about before because we weren't speaking their language and we wouldn't, we wouldn't ever have Googled this kind of term. Right? So even if it just means that we are, we are discovering things for ourselves that we couldn't do before, that we couldn't do before, that's already helpful for me. Okay, um, that's the summary for linear algebra. I'm like three minutes over time, so I have to speed up a little bit for the second half. Um, just, the story is extremely similar to what I told you on Saturday. Just like in integration, just like in the solution of differential equations, there is a direct connection between certain extremely elementary algorithms, 200-year-old algorithms, and extremely elementary inference algorithms. Gaussian parametric inference, and Gaussian elimination. Actually, uh, the sweet irony of this is that both of these methods, Gaussian conditioning and Gaussian elimination, were invented by the same guy in the same paper in 1809, right? in the motion of celestial bodies. And he just didn't know that he was just using a tool that he invented that is the same thing as the stuff that he used it on to solve his actual problem. Um, Gaussian elimination is the case where you, you, you in, some sort of, in a vague sense, you search along non-calibrated directions, sort of canonical directions. If you choose to construct informative directions, you end up with a method called conjugate gradients. To get to that, we had to make some structural assumptions. We, did, we didn't have to restrict the hypothesis class, but we had to restrict the model class to get low, low computational cost, and we had to choose um, we have to calibrate the uncertainty at runtime in a really uh, careful way to not produce additional computational cost. So clearly it's not a good idea to run a maximum likelihood parameter optimization rule in your matrix inversion algorithm, because then you're calling a very expensive method from within a very elementary method. You have to find a way of performing this kind of calibration operation at basically no cost, and that's a way of doing this. Um, one way of using this is to share information between related numerical computations, which unfortunately numerical mathematicians have thought of as well. They are quite smart people. Okay, so now I'll basically skip up. Uh, okay, quick question. Um, yes, and it's a little bit fickle. So uh, the, 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 the simple answer would be, so the question is, uh, what about preconditioning? How do you, what does it mean to precondition conjugate gradients? Um, it would be nice if I could say it's just a prior mean changing the prior mean. Unfortunately, it's not quite right, 
because peak conditioning is, involves rescaling the entire space, while changing the prior mean doesn't change the covariance. So actually, peak conditioning involves changing both the prior mean and the prior covariance in a particular way. But it is essentially using prior information to simplify the problem. Yeah. Okay, so I will not say much about nonlinear optimizations because Steve Boyd gave a wonderful uh, three session talk about that. I'll just point out one interesting result, and that is that so in the, in the space of problems, in the, in, the, in the task of finding the root of a gradient of a nonlinear function that is either convex or non convex, there is a family of methods that many of you will have heard about called quasi Newton methods. These are methods that estimate the Hessian or the inverse Hessian of an objective function. The most famous one of them is called BFGS. You can't see anything on this plot, doesn't matter. Um, this is the Rosenbrock polynomial, and here's an algorithm estimating local curvature of this function everywhere and then converging. This algorithm, the BFGS method, can be written as a filter. So it can also be interpreted as some particular Gaussian inference rule. In fact, even more excitingly, if you run BFGS on a linear problem, on a quadratic function, it is exactly equal to conjugate gradients. So these two are very, very close to each other. They're not, they're, it's really, to get from conjugate gradients to BFGS is a really minor step. You basically just do conjugate gradients and just don't care about the fact that you're running a nonlinear problem, essentially. That's almost true. Okay, but I didn't want to talk about nonlinear optimization. Instead, I want to move on to global optimization. So that's the task of given a function, just any function, not a convex function, just any function, tell me where the minimum of that function is. The minimum. Not the local minimum, any minimum. The actual global minimum. This is an area, it's quite, it's quite exciting, this is maybe the oldest area where machine learning has been thinking about solving a, let's say, computational or numerical task for about 10 years already, and there is basically no directly related prior art in the applied math communities. Um, this is the probabilistic solution to this, it's called Bayesian optimization. Hands up, who's heard of Bayesian optimization before? About half the room, okay. So this is by now actually quite an interesting uh, kind of field. This has been around for about 10 years. The first NIFS workshop I think was in 2007 or so, so um, or maybe 2009. So things have evolved already quite a bit. The theory on this has evolved a bit more and we have some quite interesting results. Um, the reason I want to talk about it again is I first want to give you a bit of a flavor for how these algorithms work. In case you haven't, the, the one half of you is at the bottom right here who hasn't, hasn't heard so much yet about this, these, these methods. And then I'll also tell you maybe something you, like the other half of you hasn't heard yet about how to use these methods in elementary computation and not just in sort of high level of, uh, problems. Here's the kind of problem you have to solve. This is the toy example. Imagine ooh, the kind of problem you should think about in your head is um, a very high level problem. So you're building a large machine learning algorithm. Let's say, okay, let's keep it simple. Let's say we have a million data points and we're trying to train an SVM classifier on this problem. To train an SVM, we, one thing we have to fix is the kernel width, right? You have to decide how wide your kernel should be. We fixed what the kernel is, but we need a width. So let's say this is the logarithm of the kernel width. It could be very, very thin. It could be very, very wide, okay? And this here is some performance measure, whatever it is. It's like bad, good, right? And we've done three experiments. We've run um, at 10 to the 2, 10 to the 1 point something, and 10 to the minus 0 point something. And those are the numbers we got out. And we only ran this on a subset of the data set, so we have some noise, actually. So those are our results. And now you'd like to know how should you choose the kernel width to get the best performance. Clearly this is hard, right? Because these three numbers don't really tell you much yet. So what people have been doing up until quite recently to solve these kind of problems is a grid search. Well, they would call it cross-validation, but really the, the choice in here is a grid search. You just run sort of on, you just do 15 experiments and you choose whichever one works best. Or you look at the plot, you sort of stare at it and you say it looks like over here is a good region, let's do an experiment over here and then let's hope that this improves. That's a bit annoying because we are a field called machine learning, not human learning. So it's really annoying that you would have to do this yourself, right? You would want an algorithm that takes care of that for you. And here's an algorithm that takes care of that. It's um, depending on kind of what papers you look at, either 50 years old or maybe 15 years old. You take a, you actually use the exact same framework that I've been talking about for now two hours already. 
you put a distribution, Gaussian distribution over the function that you are trying to infer. You make some assumptions about its smoothness. You just use this Gaussian process prior. And then you ask this distribution, what can you tell me about where the minimum might be? Because now I can, at each point, I can ask what is the distribution sort of over these function values and is this an interesting location or not? For example, you could say, this is currently my best location I found. That's the, the one best asset I have. That, that, if, if you ask me now what to do, I'll use this number. But if I can evaluate once more, what's the chance, if I evaluate at various points, that I'll get a better point? So for example, this is obviously, this is unfortunately a bit of an ugly plot. So what I've done is I've taken a straight line through this best guess, cut through each of these marginal univariate Gaussian distributions, and just computed the cumulative density for this function value to be below this yellow line. Th those are the gray lines. And uh, up here, that's this probability for this. This is called the probability of improvement. It was uh, actually proposed quite late in a PhD thesis by Dan Lizotte in 2008. And you could just evaluate wherever this number is maximized. To find that point, you have to solve a numerical optimization problem. But it's something really cheap because it just involves this simple Gaussian process posterior. It doesn't involve retraining your SVM with a different kernel size. Right? So you now decide, maybe I want to evaluate here. This is to the right of this point in between those two. And that's where I'm going to run my next experiment. Another thing you could do, which is actually an even older idea, it's a little bit more confusing to describe, but it actually is also a better algorithm, is to say, is to construct a loss or an improvement function that says, well, if I now evaluate, let's say, at this point over here, and I get a number out that is larger than this point, then I've gained nothing, because I still have that point, and that's now still my best guess. If I gain a function, which is lower, uh, a function value which is lower than the best one I have so far, then I gain uh, something, and that gain is maybe linear, linearly proportional to how much lower this number is than this point. Now, this is again an object that you can compute in a univariate Gaussian distribution very efficiently. It just involves some uh, error functions and Gaussian PDFs. And that's this yellow curve. This is called the expected improvement. And that's maybe, by, at the moment, in some sense, the state of the art. Uh, well, maybe not the state of the art, but a sort of standard approach for these kind of Bayesian optimization problems. So we've also made our own contribution to this area, but I'm not going to talk about that. This is really complicated. It involves lots of cool animated pictures. Um, and it's called entropy search, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Instead, I'm going to tell you about how currently these methods are being used. And this is maybe a great, uh, a, a unique opportunity at the MLSS for the speaker to cite one of the participants. So here's an example for uh, this, kind of, this kind of framework at work. This is a paper from uh, the AutoML workshop at ICML two weeks ago. This is from a team from Frankfurt, uh, from Freiburg, run by Frank Hutter. Um, and there are various people uh, on the author list. Some of them are here. So Katharina Egnesberger should be somewhere in the room, I hope. Is she not? There she is, over there. Uh, so if you, if you want to know how this algorithm works, just ask her after the break. I'm just going to give you the extremely high overview picture. The idea is you're running a Kaggle competition. You'd like to win this competition, but you don't want to deal with it yourself. You just set up your... Actually, it's not scikit-learn, unfortunately, but let's say you set up your scikit-learn framework, and then you want an algorithm that figures out how to choose the parameters of all of this ensemble of methods that you are going to use such that it performs well. And you do that by essentially writing down all the parameters you could optimize in this way, kind of in, like just not in 1D, but in multi-D, and then running exactly this framework. That's the high-level picture. If you really want to understand how it works, you should ask Katarina. Right? So this is, kind of the cl this is the way that at the moment, this is sort of the state of the work at the moment for this field, for Bayesian optimization. It's now used to automate machine learning, which is really a, a sort of a fun irony by itself that our field has to, in, has to figure out how to automate inference. Um, the reason I'm showing you that is that it's also a typical example for how people think at the moment about what the use is of information theoretic descriptions of optimization. It's algorithms like that, very high level optimization where you, run, you have to optimize a super expensive method. Each evaluation takes at least a minute or so. So you're willing to spend about 10 seconds deciding where you're going to put your next experiment. Um, in that sense, Bayesian optimization is often thought of and treated as a top level sort of expensive computation. That's the area that is currently becoming, so that where it's currently popular and where it's coming, actually this area has basically entered the mainstream now. So what, three weeks ago, um, 
uh, about a quarter of the community working on these, on these problems was just bought away by Twitter. They were called WetLab, and now they're gone. So uh, this, this area has reached industrial use, clearly, because people are willing to pay money for it. So um, this, is, this is really sort of a state where we can make useful contributions to the community. However, you could also argue that perhaps it's not really numerical computation. It's kind of, it's automated machine learning. It's, it's, it's a very expensive kind of computation, so it doesn't really have this numerical flavor. So what I'd, what I'd like to argue now for the next final 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, is that these ideas, that using, really thinking about where you can gain information in your computation, can also be used in very uh, low-level kind of computations in a really cheap way to improve methods that we really need for our field all the time. And I'll choose what I think is perhaps at the moment one of the most important algorithms of them all, stochastic gradient descent. So I'll tell you how to improve training a neural network, and then we'll see whether you believe me that that's a good idea or not. Um, this is stochastic gradient descent. Hands up who has not heard of stochastic gradient descent before. No one? Okay. So who has trained a neural network or a logistic regressor or an SVM or whatever with stochastic gradient descent yet? I think you should probably have all your hands up because it's probably part of one of the practicals sooner or later, right? Maybe? No, maybe no, not of Andy's practical, but maybe of the kernel practical? I don't know. Okay. This is stochastic gradient descent. Um, so what this is, is, of course, uh, this is not actually anything, it's just a s string of symbols. What I mean by that is, imagine you have a large-scale machine learning algorithm, it has a set of parameters, we call these parameters x, you would like to choose these parameters such that they minimize some objective function, the objective function is called f, we have access to the gradient of this objective function, and what we're going to do is, we'll just ask this objective, well, in which direction are you going down, and then I'll just take a step in that direction. What's the problem with Stochastic gradient descent. Step size, yeah, this green thing. You have to choose this alpha. That's a really annoying aspect. And there is no uniquely correct way to solve alpha. Do I have five minutes for a funny story about alpha? Okay, maybe I have five minutes for a funny story about alpha. So one problem that stochastic gradient descent has is that to keep asking you questions so that you don't fall asleep, how many of you in the room have a physics background? Not that many, it used to be in more at MLSSs. And how many have an engineering background? Oh, great, Woo. Okay, does that include computer scientists? If you, are a, if you are an engineer but not a computer scientist, raise your hand again. Ah, that's less, okay, good. Uh, so if, you're an, if, you're a sort of, if you've done a classic education in mechanical engineering or physics, you've learned that units have to match up. Things have to have units and units have to work. This thing does not work. X has the units of X, and the gradient of F is basically DF by DX, so this thing has units of x, this thing has units of f, so this thing has the units of, units of f or units of x, and those two are not the same. You can't just add those two numbers, they don't have the same meaning. Why is that a problem? Okay, imagine our task is not to train a neural network. Our task is, it's January 2015, Tübingen is deep in snow. I know it's almost not unbelievable, but Tübingen gets snow in the winter. And we are up here, and we are trying to build robots that can ski down the hill using gradient descent. Okay? So what they do is, they're physical implementations of an optimization problem. They're trying to minimize the potential energy per mass of their body. Potential energy is free fall acceleration times height, right? Times mass, and we'll divide by mass because that doesn't actually matter. So let's say I'm sort of, I'm a European robot built by proper engineers, so I'm using SI units. So in SI units, I am 456 meters high up here. That's the height of this building. Um, and we have a free fall acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared, which means my potential energy is 4,473 kilojoules per kilogram. Those are SI units. You could also write them as joule per gram, right? Okay, and now if I have a steep hill that has about 20% 20 uh, 20 incline, that's, or decline, that's sort of the steep part of the hill over there, then that means the gradient is 5 joules per kilogram a meter. So if I use a step size of 1, which is sort of what we all do, or maybe 0.1, Right? That's kind of the step sizes you use for SGD. Then what this robot will do is, it'll treat this number five as measured in meters, which makes no sense, but it'll just call it five meters. And it'll take a step of, let's say, 0.1 times five, that's half a meter. So it'll ski for half a meter. Then it'll measure the gradient again. and say, okay, I have to move a little bit. It'll ski for half a, liter, half a meter again. It'll change the direction a little bit, ski for half a meter, and so on. That's a meaningful way of getting down the hill. There's its colleague next door, or his cousin sitting next to it, 
which is, I don't know, built in Britain or in America, actually in America, and it's using imperial units, because imperial units are cool. In imperial units, you're measuring your height in feet. Up here, we're 1,496 feet high. You're measuring uh, energy, not in joule, but in calories, and you're measuring weight, not in kilograms, but in ounces. It's the same thing, right? It's just different units. It's not so your free fall acceleration is 32.19 feet per second squared, and uh, up here, you have a energy uh, density, essentially, of 30 calories per ounce, okay? The same incline, the same 20% decrease over there has a gradient of 10 to the minus 5 calories per ounce in foot. It's the same thing, it's just different units. But we'll treat them as measured in distance, so in feet, right? So this robot will take steps of, well, 10 to the minus 5 feet, which is about a micrometer, or 3 micrometers. Right, so it'll go, <coughs> new gradient, huh? <coughs> <coughs> And it'll take a million times longer to get down the hill. A million times. It's the same algorithm. They both work. They're both consistent, right? They have the same convergence rate. There's just a constant in front, which happens to be a million. Right? So that's a bit of an annoying constant. So it sort of reduces the performance a little bit. Of course, if our task is uh, to ski down, I don't know, not this hill, but a really, really bendy, I don't know, bobsleigh route or something, maybe this algorithm will work really badly because it'll take really large steps and it'll just, I don't know, fall out of its, wherever it's supposed to go down, right? So that's not good. We should figure out how to, f how to choose those step sizes. And if we had all the time in the world, then we could go back to some slides before and say, oh, I have to do something really fancy. I have to find the curvature of the space, and then I'll sort of find the inverse of the Hessian of this objective function, and that'll tell me which direction to move in. This is called Newton's method, and this will work really well. This is, has, a, this has, in some sense, sort of a much better convergence rate. Actually, it converges quadratically fast, not linearly fast, and so on. But we're optimizing a neural net, maybe, and this thing has a million parameters, um, and this gradient is, a, well, a million is small by these days, right? So it's a billion parameters, and we need to find uh, the right step for this billion dimensional space. I can't compute the Hessian of a billion dimensions and then invert it. And there's another problem, actually. Um, so, and that we'll get to in a second. So, oh no, actually, I'll just tell you this. There's another problem, which is we only have access to noisy gradients, of course, as you all know. So, again, because all of you know the story, here's extremely quickly. We're not just optimizing uh, some loss function, we're optimizing just an estimate of the loss function. So a typical setting in machine learning is that you have a model where the loss consists of a sum over small losses, one, for each, one term for each data point. So each data point yi has a particular loss function x. A Bayesian would call this an exchangeable model. You, have other, you might have other words for it. This is just, it's just a sum, right? a separable sum over, over these terms. So what you do is you don't take your entire data set of, I don't know, so Facebook has about a trillion data points, a trillion images of people in the world. That's too much to deal with. You just, just, you just take a bunch of them. I don't know, let's say 100. So M is 100, or maybe 10, or whatever. Right? Um, and then you compute the loss for each of them. That's now just 10 terms rather than a trillion. You sum over them, you divide by the number of uh, data points in both cases. Then this is an estimate for this. Actually, it's a pretty good estimate, because if you draw your data points IID, then this is an unbiased estimate. And it has, by the central limit theorem, approximately Gaussian noise, because it's a sum over IID variables. Right? And the Gaussian noise, so it's the, this estimate is approximately the true loss plus some Gaussian noise, where the Gaussian noise scales like something like 1 over, uh, well, the, so the error scales like 1 over the square root of the number of samples in your mini-batch, right? If you call that a mini-batch or a batch or whatever your word for that is. Okay, so that's a problem because you don't have access to this noise-free, to the noise-free gradient. If you had access to the noise-free gradient, if we could really evaluate this thing and we just wanted to find alpha, there's a classic way of finding this alpha, which is actually a really neat algorithm. And in the classic optimization literature has been develop, developed over the past 50 years or so into a really mature, trustable, wonderful class of extremely lightweight algorithms, and they are called line searches. They are so simple that nobody even thinks about them anymore. You just assume that they are there and that they work, because they are really, really robust methods. How do they work? Here is, this is what a line search does. It repeatedly evaluates the function along the search direction. So you've decided we're going to walk in this direction. We don't know yet how far. And we'll make some probing evaluations until we found the point that we, find, we think is a good point to step to. And to do that, we have two constraints. We're looking for a point which is further down than the one we're currently at. So more precisely, a point which is below this black line. So that black line is the current gradient, 
times some number that's smaller than one, so that we are a little bit cautious. And we, we, but we also want the point that is actually where the function becomes flat in this direction. We don't want to overshoot and go uphill again, or we don't want to be in a region where we're still going downhill, um, even though we're now below the initial point. So what the method will do is, it'll first evaluate over here. This is sort of our American cousin doing a very, very sh small step. It discovers that that's not a good step because we're still going down. That's not a good thing to do. So we'll just double our step size, go to this point, evaluate here again. We're still going down. That's like, not a point to stop yet. So we'll double our step size again. Ooh, so now we are like, beyond the true minimum. We've gone, gone uphill again. So what we'll do now is we'll interpolate between those two numbers and decide where might the true minimum be. Maybe it's over here. We'll evaluate again. Um, and now we'll see that we are below this function, but we're still in a region where the gradient is still quite negative, so we're still going downhill. So we'll take a, a further interpolation step between those two, check out this point, and now we discover that we actually have a gradient which is almost zero. So this second constraint is called the second Wolfe condition. These two constraints are called Wolfe conditions. This is the first Wolfe condition, this is the second Wolfe condition. And so the first constraint is this gray area, the second constraint are these little pinwheels which say our gradient has to be flat, right? Not zero, but it has to be in absolute values less than some number, or maybe just in not absolute values, just its value has to be larger than some number. That would be the weak and strong version of these constraints. Then at this point would be accepted. Accepted means that's where we're going to move to. That's our alpha for this step. And now you get to choose the next search direction, then you call the line search again and it moves on. Unfortunately, does this here does not work if you have noisy gradients. Because this is clearly a very aggressive scheme, right? We double our step size until we reach the point where we have a large gradient. Then we sort of do some bisection in some way or another to decide where to move then. So if the gradient here uh, is a little bit noisy, we might decide that this is a bad point, but actually the true gradient is maybe still pointing down. Or maybe, we, maybe this function evaluation here was noisy and actually it's further down. If you have a very small mini batch, then maybe there's a lot of noise on these evaluations and you really don't know what's going on. And then you might reject or accept steps that are completely inefficient. So what we need is a way of making these line searches robust to noise. We need probabilistic versions of these methods. And that's keeping in my theme of turning computations into inference. Building numerical methods that can take uncertain inputs, that can take probability measures over their inputs and still work afterwards. So I'll tell you in five or 10 minutes how to build a probabilistic line search. This is a paper by Maren, who is sitting over there in the corner and it's just sat down. Um, it's not yet published, but it's on the archive. So you can, it's actually be on the archive for quite a while already. So you can uh, find it over there. Okay, so the ingredients for a probabilistic line search are, this is actually a really cool little project because it's really just taking, building together, building blocks from areas that we've already done. So it's gonna be very simple and easy, like a little Lego toolbox. So, again, we need a joint probability distribution over everything we have seen and everything we'd like to compute. What's that going to be? We're talking about functions, so it's going to be a Gaussian process because there's no other really good probability distribution over spaces of functions, right? Measures over spaces of functions. We'll take a Gaussian process, so this is what the process is going to be. But we won't take any Gaussian process because we have a certain requirement for our, for our process. Actually, we have two requirements. The first one is that we need this method to be really robust. We need it to be able to work with a small number of data points. It, it, it has to extrapolate all the time. So it has to be robust to extrapolation, and it has to be robust to really crazy function values. Because objective functions of neural networks are really nasty functions. They are not smooth, they're not infinitely often differentiable, so we're not going to use a Gaussian kernel. Neil warned us against this, so we're not going to do it. Instead, we're going to use a really wonderful kernel, which is this one. This is the integral over a Wiener process. So you take this really, really rough Wiener process, this Brownian motion, and then you integrate it over time. Then you get this function back, this covariance function. And interestingly, this Gaussian process with a zero mean yields what's called cubic splines. So those of you who have done computer vision or any kind of graphics know about cubic splines. And those of you who are doing control as well, of course. These are methods, these are, these are interpolants which produce piecewise cubic posterior mean functions. Posterior mean uh, cubic functions have a few wonderful properties. One of them is that they are really robust. You can make them extremely bendy and they won't go crazy. The other one is that you can analytically compute local minima. So if I ask you, I have two, uh, three evaluations here, 
what is your dis what, what's the distribution? Uh, uh, what's, what's the posterior mean function in between those data points? Then you can say, well, in here it's a cubic polynomial, in here it's a cubic polynomial, in here it's a cubic polynomial. I don't even have to tell you all these numbers. I just have to tell you three numbers or four actually for the four numbers that make up a cubic polynomial, and then that describes the entire curve. So this is the gradient of this function. It's a quadratic function, a piecewise quadratic function. Quadratic functions have analytic roots, so I can tell you where this point and this point lies in closed form, just by evaluating the four numbers that make up this cell and just doing a very simple floating point operation. This is the second derivative, this is the third derivative. There's no Gaussian distribution over them anymore. It doesn't exist, it's a white noise process, but the mean function still exists. As Neil pointed out, mean functions of, posterior, of Gaussian processes are more regular than Gaussian processes themselves. So the mean function can exist even though the process doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so we can use that to construct a sequence of interesting points that we can think about. Here is our line search in action. These are the same points as before, but now I've added Gaussian noise to everything. So now we have a Gaussian process, posterior. We have our data points. And now we can go through these cells, finitely many cells, and just ask for each cell, there are now six of them, right? Is there a minimum, a local minimum in this cell? The answer is no, because the quadratic in this cell has no roots. Is there a minimum in this cell? No, the quadratic in this cell has no roots. Is there a minimum in this cell? No, the quadratic in this cell has no roots. Is there a minimum in this cell? Yes, there is one over here. Okay, that's an interesting point. That might be interesting to look at. Is there a minimum in this cell? No. Is there, so the, the other option we could take is we could extrapolate. We could just take another step out, right? And you can just evaluate the Gaussian distribution at this point, which you can't even see somewhere up here. So there's another black dot over here, which is another possible candidate for the next step. Now we need to decide which of these two or at most six points we're going to choose to evaluate at. And for that, we'll do Bayesian optimization. So we'll just compute the expected improvement of an evaluation at this point and an evaluation at this point. That's two numbers to compute, and computing them involves one error function for each of them and one exponential function for each of them. That's not expensive, right? Scalar numbers. So we're training a neural network, things are expensive. We're gonna compute billion dimensional gradients. This is not expensive. And we just choose whichever of the two has the higher expected improvement. Clearly it's going to be this one because it's very unlikely that that's a good point. And then we'll evaluate there and we'll continue. So that's a process that produces, explore, that explores the space to find good points. The final thing we need is a rule for stopping once we're done. So this is the information theoretic way of collecting data. And now we also need an information theoretic way of stopping the computation. And for that, there is a final slide of nasty algebra, which is extremely simple. What we do is we look at these two classic Wolfer conditions. So that's this, that's this line and those pinwheels, right? Um, and you see that these are um, inequalities. They, they, they're, they're saying, I want the function value to be below a certain line, and I want the gradient to be above a certain line. Obviously, you can rearrange these inequalities such that there is a zero on one side, and then on the other side, there's just a linear function of these four numbers, the function value and the gradient at the initial point and the function value at the gradient and the gradient at some exploration point. So it's a linear projection of jointly Gaussian variables. And linear projections of Gaussian variables are Gaussian variables. So these two numbers are just jointly Gaussian distributed variables and the joint distribution is some <laughs> ugly thing, but it's just two numbers, right? It's two floating point numbers. So what we are asking is, what's the probability that both of these numbers This is A, this is B. There's a joint Gaussian distribution over them. What's the probability that both of them are larger than zero? That's easy to compute. That's called a bivariate Gaussian cumulative density. Uh, there's simple code for that that you can download from uh, a guy called Alan Gens. In, uh, in, in, um, I don't actually know where he is, somewhere in the States. He spent his entire career building extremely efficient code for problems like this. It runs very, very fast, and it gives you an answer for each point that you might consider. So now we have the same plot as before. Here are our six points. This is what the line search did, essentially. At each point, we can now ask, at this state of the method, is one of these evaluation points sufficiently good that we're going to stop the computation? This is this black curve here. That's this probability of the Wolfe conditions be fulfilled. It's a number between 0 and 1, obviously, because it's a probability. So at these points here, it's very unlikely to be acceptable. So this one is definitely not acceptable. These, this one, neither. This one, neither. This one is, has a tiny probability of being acceptable. This one, 
has a slightly larger chance of being acceptable, but this one is really good. So now we're just going to stop. That's the point we're going to accept, and now hand on. So now we've built a tiny little black box, actually, for this optimization problem, which has, as it turns out, actually can be written without any free parameters, so you don't have to sort of even think about them. We can even build black boxes that can deal with probability distributions coming in, and it's essentially returning a probability distribution, which is these numbers here. It's saying, it's quite likely that this is an acceptable point. You get to choose whether you want to continue your computation or not, but typically you'll just say, I, I'm continuing my computation now. Please stop, right? So does this work? On that, I'll end. Uh, here's some examples of these line searches. This is from the paper. You can find this all on archive. Um, so uh, what we've done is a very simple experiment We've sort of reproduced what you'd normally do when you train a neural network. We've taken everyone's favorite data sets, CIFAR10 and MNIST. I know these are small data sets, and now everyone wants to do ImageNet or something, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're dealing with a univariate optimization problem here. We're not talking about finding the best neural network, right? We're just solving a tiny little subproblem of your uh, training scheme. And what we've done is we've built two different uh, uh, feedforward perceptrons, multilayer feedforward perceptrons. Um, the one for MNIST has something like a half a million parameters, and the one for CIFAR10 has, Maren, how many optimization parameters? <coughs> Two and a half million. So it's, kind of, it's a small problem. It's not a billion weights, but it's a meaningful network. And then we've decided what learning weight should be used. So one, option number one is you just run five experiments, or maybe 50 experiments. I'm sure that's what many of you have already done, with different learning weights. One with a learning weight, this is a bit crazy, right? Learning rates 10 to the minus 4 up to learning rates 5. And then we let them run until, essentially until convergence for a long time and ask what is the test error that these particular choices of learning rates achieve. Obviously, that's expensive because you have to run all these experiments just to throw them away, essentially. Uh, and it turns out, of course, so this, is, this one here, this, this line, that's if you choose stochastic gradient descent to run with this particular st uh, step size and you never change the step size. You could also decay the step size as it, uh, during the experiment and you'd get this curve up here. What you could also do is you could just start any of these instances using the line search and just let the line search figure out what the right step sizes are for every individual step. This will add a cost overhead of basically zero to your computation. Um, it'll just run and it'll produce this curve down here, which is essentially as good as the best possible choice you could have made without even thinking about it. It's just a black box you've just added, and now you don't have to worry about step sizes anymore in your stochastic gradient descent. Here's the same experiment for MNIST. Again, this is what you get in terms of test error if you uh, do your exploratory experiments with lots of different uh, step sizes, or if you just run an instance with a line search. Andy. Oh, yes, yeah. So the cost is not zero. The cost is computing the posterior mean of a Gaussian process with five data points. So it's, you have to invert, well, five or whatever, four. Ah, yes, so that's true, yeah. So these plots are in terms of uh, here. These, these plots in, down here are function evaluation of function values in terms of number of function evaluations. So if a line search makes 10 evaluations, that's 10 whatever the instance, but this is the, like normalized by epoch, right? So that's sort of the equivalent of 10 steps in this, in this plot. So yes, you will, you will sometimes take several steps in one direction rather than one step in one direction and a step in another direction, but that step tends to be a better one, right? And you see, so this, this, is, this is for the, sorry, I should have explained these plots as well. This is function values. No, it's test error. It's test error through the epoch um, for a, a, a population of problems sampled from different starting points with the line search with SGD with a fixed uh, step size and SGD with a decaying step size. And you see sort of, if you get lucky, you might get a really good performing SGD, but if you're unlucky and you choose a bad step size, it'll just not work well, right? So this is sort of a headache you have to deal with if you do that, and if you use a method like this, you don't have to deal with it, you just run it, yes. And the cost overhead is, okay, you have a very good point, but just beyond this, the cost overhead of making this computation is in each step computing a bunch of floating point numbers. So even though, this is actually quite fun, the, the methods we're using here are some of the most expensive machine learning methods people think about. It's Bayesian optimization, it's GP regression, and kind of multivariate integrals on Gaussian distributions. And yet, they end up being some of the cheapest kind of things you can do. It's cubic spline interpolation, it's evaluating two error functions, and evaluating a bivariate error function. 
OK. Good. So basically, using a adding probabilistic functionality to a really, really tiny, simple elementary numerical method, just being able to deal with probabilistic inputs allows you to get rid of certain parameters that are otherwise a huge pain to deal with in uh, really tangible, important optimization problems in machine learning. With that, and then there are three of these black slides, so I'm going to wrap up in about three minutes. The big picture again, from Saturday and today, there is a deep connection between computation and inference. I've now said that about eight, eight times because I'm really trying to drive home that point. Performing a computation means collecting information about the value of some latent quantity. Actively collecting information about this value because you have to really decide what computations to perform. This connection is not just philosophical, it's also mathematically quite precise. I've shown you some quite direct connections between Gaussian integration and Gaussian process regression, between solving differential equations with Wunge-Hutta methods and Kalman filters, between today uh, conjugate gradients and Gauss-Jordan elimination and simple Gaussian conditioning. Uh, I've also just skimmed over BFGS. And using this kind of insight, using the fact that your methods are basically collecting information, allows you to think about how to improve them both in terms of efficiency and in terms of functionality. That means you should you really try to think about numerical methods, even if they are presented to you as black boxes that you shouldn't think about. It's once you actually have to deal with computational efficiency, it's a good idea to think about what these methods do. I've shown just a few simple examples of applications. The really tiny, simplest one is to just draw samples and show them to the user and say, this is a representation of my uncertainty over this computation. I've shown you how to include prior information you have available about your problem in a hard way to improve the computational performance. I've shown you a simple idea to share information between related computations of the same type, between co-varying computational problems to reduce redundancy, essentially, but in a soft way, right? not by hard uh, conditioning. And maybe the biggest picture and the most open kind of area is the propagation of uncertainty through the entire chain of computation in machine learning at very low cost overhead to identify sources of error and sources of inefficiency. So I think for the past, well, I don't know, many years, there's been a big focus in machine learning on the uncertainty arising from data, at least in the probabilistic Bayesian subset of machine learning. People have talked a lot about uncertainty arising from finite data. I think now it's also time to think about uncertainty arising from finite resources for computation, because we're definitely reaching an age, this famous big data age, in which we don't have enough computation anymore to even look at every data point. That's the end. I hope I've convinced you that the idea of assigning uncertainty to the result of deterministic computations at runtime, at low computational cost, is an exciting paradigm to think about. There's a very small, young community of people thinking about this. There are many workshops running. There will hopefully be one at NIPS. There's definitely going to be one at the next ISPA meeting in January. There might be other ones coming up pretty soon. In fact, there will be one coming up maybe in November. Um, they are all on this web page. There's also a list of publications on this web page, of relevant publications. If you are deciding to work on something like this and you'd like this publication to be on this list, please send us an email. I would be very happy to see some of you, perhaps at NIPS, for one of our workshops. Thanks.